first candle, which is purple, symbolizes hope. It represents the expectation felt in anticipation of the coming of Messiah.
Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to the Front Royal Presbyterian Church. And if you're joining us today by way of the internet, we greet you and welcome you. By the way, Happy New Year. Because this is the first day of the Christian calendar year. It's the beginning of Advent as we anticipate and wait for Christmas. But it's also a time of preparation. And so it's appropriate to gather together on this day as we begin the Advent season to prepare our hearts to celebrate the wondrous Christmas message. So we're glad you're joining us today. And I invite you to come and join us in person in our worship services. We're meeting again back in the sanctuary and we'd love to have you join us there as we gather together to worship God. Let us come now and worship God. The call to worship. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? Christ is coming. We place our hopes in the King of Kings, the Prince of Peace, the Infant Lowly. Can you see it? Can you smell it? Christ is coming. We place our hopes in a Middle Eastern child born in poverty. Can you taste it? Can you sense it? Christ is coming. We place our hope in an infant born in the margins of society. Come, friends, the season of Advent begins. We gather to worship Emmanuel, God with us. Hello from the Logan House, and uh, we are um, very happy to join in with the church in celebrating this first Sunday of Advent. So let us start with by reading scripture. This is from uh, chapter nine of Isaiah, verse two and verses six through seven. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Every year, we light candles as we prepare for the coming of Christ. More and more candles, more and more light, as we watch and wait for Jesus, who is the light of the world. God, God of promise, come into our darkness. Renew your hope in us, for you alone bring life out of death. Receive God's promise of hope from Psalm 33. 
The eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope into you. Let us pray. <laughs> Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Keep us watchful and ready for the signs of your return. Keep us from being overcome with anxiety and sorrow. And keep us faithful to the end. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Light on candles to watch for Messiah, let the light banish darkness. He shall bring salvation to Israel, God fulfills the The Call to Confession Friends, the season of Advent is a time of preparation. Preparation to welcome Emmanuel to our midst. Part of that preparation is the honest practice of confessing our sins before God and one another. Together, let us confess our need for forgiveness. The Confession Loving and merciful God, today we light the candle of hope, a beacon of light that shines in the darkness. Today we confess the ways we have caused others to feel hopeless. Some feel the hopelessness of hunger because of our greed. Others feel the hopelessness of violence because of our apathy. Still others feel the hopefulness of racism because of our ignorance. Forgive us, gracious God. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from <laughs> for they have been from of old. All right, we're gonna do this one over again. Okay. <laughs> the confession. <clears throat> Loving and merciful God, today we light the candle of hope a beacon of light that shines in the darkness. Today we confess the ways we have called others to feel hopeless. Some feel the hopelessness of hunger because of our greed. Others feel the hopelessness of violence because of our apathy. Still others feel the hopelessness of racism because of our ignorance. Forgive us, gracious God, be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. This we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. John says that God is faithful and just to forgive us for all of our sins and to cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Receive the grace of God and be forgiven through Jesus Christ our Lord.
Did you see? Did you see? The first candle is lit. Ooh, it started. Ooh, Advent. Yep, Advent is upon us. Ooh, I get to open the first window on my Advent calendar. Mmm, mm, mm, delicious Advent. When do I get to have another? Tomorrow. When do we light another candle? Next week. Christmas pageant? Two weeks. When do we decorate? Later. When do we open presents? In about four weeks. Four weeks? That's like almost a month. Like I always say, the big flaw with Advent is that it takes so long. Advent is so slow. What if it wasn't? Are we talking about time travel? Because my mom says I shouldn't hang out with kids who are messing with time travel. I'm supposed to just say no thank you and come home. No, I mean, what if we did all of our favorite Advent activities right now? Yes! Wait, can we do that? No more thinking. Let's do it! Yeah! yeah! If that's okay, Jesus. Oh, oh, okay. Angels, we have heard on high. Next. Oh, come on. Something. All set, Victor! Okay, everyone, places! Places for the pageant! Now pose and line! Behold, I bring and you... And good enough! Oh. 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 Everyone okay? <sighs> yeah. What's next? That was it. We fit all four weeks of Evan into a single afternoon. Yay! Yay. So does that mean Advent is over? Yep. Well, that's a let down. Now what are we going to do until Christmas? Call to offering. In this season of Advent, there is no greater time to recognize the blessings and gifts before us. It was God that gave us all that what is and ever will be so that we may be called his children and live lives in response to the gifts of Jesus Christ. You may give online at tithely.com or send a check to the church. As we prepare our budget for the year to come, please watch your email and mail for further information and ways in which you can continue the work of Christ with us here at the Front Royal Presbyterian Church. Our gracious God, we thank you for the most wondrous gift, the gift of our very lives, and the gift of your Son that helps us come to understand what it means to be your children and to live fully alive, which is why we bring our gifts and offerings unto you to be a part of that story and that good news. Receive these gifts now and use them for your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
scripture reading from Jeremiah 33, verses 14 through 16. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judea. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judea will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called, the Lord our righteous Savior. We all bring those that we love and care for who are going through difficult times in our hearts to the Lord to get together as we pray, remembering those on our hearts. Let us pray. Lord, you came into this world with all of its sorrows. You know our hurts and our struggles and our pains. You know what we're going through. And Lord, we bring to you our heart full of concerns for those that we love and are going, for those that are going through difficult and trying times, as well as our own struggles that we're going through, because we all have them. For this world is filled with struggle, with sorrow, which is why we need to come here today and hear you speak to our hearts and tell us again of your love that is triumphant. Speak to us. And Lord, we lift up those in our hearts and in our, in our lives and around us that are going through really difficult times today. And we pray that your spirit would touch their hearts and speak to them of your love that is triumphant. Make us vigilant, O oh Lord, 
Help us to keep our hearts alert, that we might be aware of all the places that you meet us and that you are working in our lives and in this world, whether it's, whether it's in our personal lives or whether it's in this country that is torn apart or whether it's in this world filled with hate. Help us to see the traces of your love that is moving everywhere. And for your love that is triumphant. Help us to see your love everywhere in our lives. Every dark spot and corner, every struggle, help us to see and feel the touch of your love and your care. Come to us, O oh Lord, and dwell in us and fill us with hope. For we offer our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The scripture lesson for today comes from Luke chapter 21, beginning with verse 25. I always have people ask me, why do we start off Advent talking about this? That's an interesting question, an appropriate question. But let us hear the word of God. There will be signs in the sun, Jesus says, the moon and the stars and on earth distress among nations confused by the roaring of the seas and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up, raise your head, because your redemption is drawing near. And then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all of, and all the trees, as soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dis dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. And that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. And this is the reading of God's Word. Thanks be to God. Like a child of wood sent to reveal and to mend, like a child and a friend, Jesus comes. Like a child we may find 
Do you remember Calvin and Hobbes? I, I, it's my favorite, favorite of them. Calvin's talking to Hobbes and, um, and, and, and he says, you know, you have to live for the moment. That's my motto. You never know how long you're going to have. You, you could step in the road tomorrow and, uh, and wham, you get hit by a cement truck. Live for the moment. That's what I always say. And then he asks Hobbes, what's your motto? And Hobbes replies, my motto is look down the road. What do you see when you look down the road? When you look down the road of your life and of this world, what do you see? Uh, this is a strange passage for us to begin the Christmas season with because, well, it's, it just doesn't seem to fit with the Christmas story. It's, it's so radical. It's so, it's so hard to understand. It reminds me of a, of a pastor who was watching a TV evangelist and he was talking about the end times and he had written a book <coughs> excuse me, on the end times and uh, after his commercial he said uh, you could have this book for only $15.95 so the minister calls up the, the, the person who's standing by and, um, and, and he says I'd like to have that book she says okay can I have your credit card number he said oh no if he believes what he's saying he doesn't need the money because we're not going to be around and the woman who was taking his orders suddenly was no longer standing by. Apocalyptic literature, it's a tough way to start the Advent season. And especially when we have so much confusion. The apocalypse, which means apocalypse, the Greek word means unveiling, revealing. So what is it that God is trying to reveal to us in apocalyptic literature? Is God trying to map out for us exactly when the last days are going to be and, and how, to, how to see that and prepare for it so it doesn't take us by surprise? I don't think so. Because I hear Jesus' words so loud and clear. No one knows. No one knows when the end time is. That's not the point. So what is the point of apocalyptic literature? And we've missed this so much. The point is, it's a beautiful part of Revelation where, where John sees the Lamb who is slain and yet standing. That's the point. The point is that, that we go through terrible times in this world and in our lives, but, but God is always standing there in the midst of us. And, his love is triumphant. That's the message of, of the apocalyptic literature and of this passage even this morning. Do you remember W.H. Uh, Auden's For the Time Being, a Christmas oratory where he has Herod? Interesting, he has Herod who says, I want a God who is predictable. I ask for God who, who should be as much like me as possible. What use to me is a God whose divinity consists in doing different things that I cannot do or saying clever things I cannot understand? The God I want and intend to get must be someone I can recognize immediately without having to wait and see what he says or does. I think Auden actually picks up our desires very well in those words of Herod. But life is not like that. We don't get the God we want. We get a God full of surprises. Isn't that what Christmas story is about? A God full of surprises. Because life is, uh, well, it's unpredictable. I remember years and years ago, back when I was uh, working full time as a pastor, uh, I, I was going to take the youth to Disneyland or Disney World, whatever it is in Florida. And I was warning the kids, make sure you get your driver's license or your identity card. You've got to have that to get on the airplane. And I kept stressing them over and over and over. So finally the day came. We drove all the way to the airport, checked in all the kids. They asked for my 
driver's license, it was not in my bail file. I couldn't imagine what happened to my driver's license. When did I use it last? And there I was, suddenly, uh, being interviewed by, they had to call the Fairfax police to come and interview me. And then they said they were going to have to do a, a search. And uh, they put me in this glass cage. I thought they were going to do a strip search of me right there in this glass cage. And of course, it wasn't a strip search, fortunately. Finally, they let me go on because I finally said, look, I got 15 kids here. You want me to put them on the plane without any adult <laughs> supervision? I think they, that scared them more than, uh, than me being a terrorist. Didn't help that there is a terrorist with my name. And uh, that raised a lot of red flags too. So um, um, it was just a day of unbelievable surprises and none of them any good. But I finally got there to Florida with them. Had to go through the whole same thing when we came back to get on the plane again, even though I'd already been through all this. But I kept thinking, you know, how you're, you know, you're just clicking along and everything's going so well, and then wham! <laughs> Life suddenly takes a turn and everything starts messing up. Just when you think you're in control, it's like you get reminded that in this life, you're not in control. <laughs> you're just not. You'd like to be. I'd like to have a God I could control. Who was it uh, that said that you know you've created God in your image when he hates everybody you hate? You know, I'd like to have a God I could control, just like me. But wham, God is a God of surprises. Now there's some good news in that, but it's also kind of scary too. You, you know, you think of Abraham who was a, had a nice life going and God comes to him and says, look, Abraham, I want you to leave everything and I want you to go to another land and I, I'll tell you later when you get there where it is. What? I, I don't know what would cause Abraham to say yes to such an invitation. Or what about Moses? Moses had the good life in Pharaoh's court until he slipped up and killed an Egyptian soldier. And suddenly he was on the run from, from the law out in the, in the desert thinking his life was completely over. You know, we feel like that sometimes. We go through things and, and, and Moses had good reason to feel that way, I might not add. And then surprise, suddenly he sees a burning bush and in that bush, somehow the word of God came to Moses. Wow, over and over, all through the Bible, it's stories of how, how people kind, kind of come to the end of their lives almost and then suddenly, wham, there's God. Surprise, surprise. Why, why even consider the Christmas story? Mary and Joseph are, are looking forward to their marriage and starting life together as young couples do. Everything's so exciting and wonderful. And suddenly, there's this baby. They don't understand. They're shocked. They're shamed. Joseph thought their life was over. He thought the marriage was over. He was ready to walk away and, and sink into his dark, dismal life of dis despair and disappointment. And surprise! God says, that's not the end of the story. There's good news here. That's what the whole Christmas story is about, isn't it? Jesus describes a world of anxiety in his passage and why, even the seas are roaring. The seas, by the way, represent chaos in the Bible. You remember in the creation story how, how chaos covered the earth, the waters. In Revelation, the new world and the new heavens shows a picture of a world with no seas. <laughs> no chaos. But in the midst of all this chaos, God comes into this world and and. He drops down in us, among us, when we least expect it, and gives us hope. Christmas is not about the fact that Jesus came so many years ago or that Jesus will come again, which we believe that he will sometime in the future. To me, Christmas is a reminder that God is always in our world. 
working unbelievable things, things you've never even dreamed of or imagined possible, God is at work in, in our world. This is the whole basis of hope. When the skies seem to have opened up and the skies seem uh, come crashing in on us and the, the seas are roaring, God is coming down. He's going to meet us. And he's going to meet us with hope and with love and with surprise. Now, now, I know the problem is, how do you tell the difference between an intrusion, a, a, a surprise that is disastrous, and an intrusion that is wonderful and hopeful? We do have a problem with that, don't we? The good news that Jesus was born was bad news for some people. Jesus' day. They were not prepared for that. Herod was not too excited about it. Pilate was certainly uh, upset about it. Didn't know what it mean, but he was scared of what it might mean. But you see, and that's what the point of apocalyptic literature is, is to let us know that in the midst of all of the chaos and darkness, God's presence is dropping into this world. Fred Craddock tells of a person who went through a time of crisis and um, kind of reached a point where she felt like she had absolutely no resources left in her life. And uh, she went to church because she was facing surgery and she was really afraid of that. So Fred, Fred Craddock said, I went to the hospital to see her after her surgery. And I walked in there and immediately she was a nervous wreck. She was scared, she was crying. She wanted me to pray with her, which I did, he says, but by her bed was a stack of books and magazines. True Love, Mira, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> Hollywood Today, and something about Elizabeth Taylor and her folks. He said, a stack of them there, and nothing, not a word to help her when her life was a wreck. She had no place to dip into some reservoir and come up with something, a word or a phrase or, or a thought or a memory or something to give her some hope and some, some basis, some foundation as she went through this scary time. It was just empty. And then he remarked, how marvelous is the life of the person <coughs> who, like a wise homemaker, when the berries and fruits and vegetables are ripe, puts them away in jars and cans in the cellar. And then when the ground is cold and icy and barren and nothing seems alive, she goes down into the cellar and comes up. And it's May and June in her family's table again. How blessed is that person. I understand why we quit coming to church during the pandemic. I think it's something we needed to do. But here's the thing, folks. You know why I keep coming to church? It's not because we're all a perfect group. Everything's wonderful. I'm afraid of being like that woman in the hospital. In times of crisis and nothing of substance around me to give me strength and hope. And when I walk in this place and see your faces and feel your touch and worship God and celebrate his good news together with you, it, it's like storing up berries in the, in the cellar. So that when I do go through those times when the skies are opening up and the seas are roaring, I will remember God is coming. He's in us and around us. Reverend David Peterson shared one afternoon a wonderful surprise he got. His daughter came in and wanted to play, and he was working on his sermon. So he said, she said, Daddy, can we play? And he said, I'm awfully sorry, sweetheart. I'm right in the middle of preparing my sermon. Let me finish that, and, and a little later on, we'll go out and play. So she turned around and went for the door and then she stopped and she said, Daddy, 
And he stopped and looked at her and said, what? She ran over to him and she gave him a great big hug. And David said, I thought you were going to give me a hug when I finished up and we were going to play. She said, I just wanted you to know what you have to look forward to. That's what apocalyptic literature is. That's what Jesus is saying to us in our text today. We live in a rough world. We go through difficult and trying times. And I don't have to tell you how difficult it is these days. But I also want to remind you what we have to look forward to. And that is God's love and presence, God's embrace. That's what Christmas is about. So this Christmas, may we be surprised by the glory of God. May we stand up and raise our heads and celebrate our hope in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now receive this benediction. May the wonder of God's love that fills this world fill you with wonder and surprise this Christmas and each day. May the power of God's love that created the universe and created your life overwhelm you with hope in the midst of your crisis and struggles. May the good news of Jesus Christ who's come into this world and coming again fill your hearts and minds in the midst of whatever you're going through today and may you rise up, stand up, lift up your head, and praise God for his wonderful surprises. You are his beloved children. Go in peace. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.